Welcome to the Center of Character and Social Responsibilities podcast, Caring, Character, and Community. A major part of the CCSR's mission is to facilitate conversations among educators, community organizers, and engaged citizens around the challenges of creating conditions in our schools and communities that will allow all our children to flourish. The focus of this season is on the role of how a how focus on caring, our own and others' character development, and a commitment to community has guided decisions of leaders in times of, of crisis. It is our pleasure and honor to introduce Pam Ed- Edinger, who is president of the Bunker Hill Community College, the largest of 15 community colleges in Massachusetts, which seeks to empower and inspire students, faculty, and staff diverse in identities, experiences, and ideas to make meaningful contributions to their local and global communities. The college embodies a spirit of inquiry, critical thought, inclusive excellence, and lifelong learning. The college is well situated to support students in achieving post-secondary career aspirations in a challenging and changing economy. Pam, thanks so much for sharing your time with us. It is absolutely my pleasure. I wonder if we could start uh, with, with two questions. One is if you could tell us a little bit more about Bunker Hill than, than I just shared with with sure. the podcast, and also, how has this past now two years been for you guys? Yes, so Bunker Hill is, I would love to tell you that Bunker Hill is super special, one of its kind, but you know, we are a pretty typical mid-sized urban community college in the community college system of the United States. There's about 1,200 um, community colleges across the nation um, in every corner of every state, um, large, small, rural, urban, suburban, and truly community is the um, uh, center of the idea. You reflect the characteristics and serve the needs of the community um, for higher education. Bunker Hill is one of 15 um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are um, the easternmost community college with the exception of Cape Cod Community College. And we're the largest. We have about 16 to 17,000 students who comes through our doors, both credit and non-credit. Um, we offer um, two-year degrees or one-year certificates. And more recently, also workforce development training that's much shorter in duration. Um, our students are um, not kids. And that's one of the things that I that, that I correct folks all the time. They like to say, oh, the kids at your college. You're like, oh, no, they're not kids. Um, only about a third of our students are traditional age, traditional as in just out of high school. The other two thirds are adults. Um, the average age is about 26, 26, 27. And they live, they all live within eight miles um, or they come to the college within eight miles radius. And they use the, the orange line. We have a stop on the, on, the, um, on the public transit. I think out of, the, uh, out of our uh, student body, three out of five are parents. And they're usually taking care of parents while they parent. Um, and about half of our parents are single moms. Three quarters of our students live within the lowest two quintile of income. And this is significant because when you compare that to our selective colleges um, just across the river, uh, 77% of their student body are in the upper two quintile of income. So so the the unit of transformation in the community colleges um, is is much more to me impactful um, in a way. Uh, because the, the folks who get degrees from our colleges usually move up at least two quintile. Mm. And that changes generational wealth accumulation and really changes the trajectory of the students as they graduate in the workforce, you know, in the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, about 54%, and that's a really specific number because we did um, a survey very recently, about 54% of our students are food insecure. Um, which means over the last 30 days, they had to make choices between eating well or eating and other things like buying books, taking the train to college, um, supporting their, the kids um, and, and basically outfitting their lives. Um, so food is not necessarily a stable, um, but a choice. 
which is really kind of scary. Uh, about 14% of our students are um, homeless, which means they're couch surfing, they are living in shelters, and many times living in shelters with their family. Um, so we reflect really um, the communities of color um, and, and the communities of poverty um, in the greater Boston area and its gateway cities or rival cities uh, where immigrants first land yeah. when they come to the United States. So our students, about half if not three quarters of our students do not have English as their first language, which means they are emerging bilingual, which is a huge asset yeah. for yeah. the city. Um, and, and, and we are we are very, very keen on seeing our students from the prospect of their cultural wealth, right? Their ability to bring more than one culture into the classroom and into the community. Um, and their emerging talent in serving um, the workforce. So having told you all that, um, it seems like that our students are needy. Um, and many in the community colleges used to sort of position the community colleges in that way. Um, we've stopped that now because we really do realize that particularly now that we're in post COVID or getting to post COVID that the backbone of our workforce across the nation is at the community colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so when you ask me, you know, how, how are your students doing? How is the college doing through COVID? Um, COVID has been a huge inflection point, I think, both individually for our students and for the community college movement, and in some ways, in the way that um, changes in the whole sector of higher education are occurring. So let me let me. Yeah, I'd love to have an example. Can you give me an example of that? That 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 you know, you're right. A lot of us don't. We know we're living in a changing economy. We know that the labor force is the, the effect of COVID is to be transformative in the way a lot of people work and opportunities for people. So, can you give us an example of how that is affecting uh, what I what I'm hearing you say are the assets of your students and yes. what they bring to this new economy that feels different to you or uh, seems to bring some hope? Yeah, I, I think you know it it works on both sides, right? So for 50 years, if not more, post-war, mm -hmm. uh, post-World War II, immediately post-World War, you know, President Roosevelt painting a, painted a vision of an equitable society. Um, the implementation, not so much. <laughs> we, we have, you, you know, the GI Bill, for example, bought houses for people, but not for Blacks. Mm -hmm. It brought people into the middle class, not for Blacks and not for people of color, and certainly not for people of poverty. Mm -hmm. And more recently, when you look at stereotypes like Ronald Reagan's welfare queens, yeah, yeah. you see all of the structural deprivation, all of the structural racism, all of the, um, and, and I'll, be, I'll be, you know, very honest, uh, white supremacy that's embedded into our educational systems um, or, are all exhibited there. Yeah. Right. We're community yeah. colleges, but when you put people of color into the community colleges, there's no support. So you're working 40, 50 hours a week and you're saying bootstrap yourself through college. Yeah. And then when they don't, you say, oh, look at the failure rate. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so, <laughs> now, so deserved so, or earned or if you were better. Right. You were so, like us. Yeah. So, so the crazy meritocracy mm -hmm. that that seems to. Um, apply in the same way at all, you know, supposedly equally across a nation whose, whose land, you know, whose, who, whose landscape are not equal. So it is, it is problematic, particularly for community college. But here's, here's what I'm seeing. COVID hit hard in our communities of color. And I can see a visible lag behind of males of color, particularly black males who are in their, uh, in their youth, my black traditional male students. So, um, and when you look at where folks are living, either in the inner city or in places like Chelsea where the Latinx communities are, are, are gathering, you have closely packed um, living conditions, yep. Yep. COVID hotspots, loss of employment, 
right? The risk of housing and businesses closing. Mm -hmm. it, it is as if the entire social and economic infrastructure is collapsing. Mm -hmm. So education, K-12 is collapsing. You can't get into colleges because you're working or you don't have money. Yep. Healthcare is collapsing. Housing is collapsing. Transportation is expensive. Childcare. Parents are caring for children at home and they don't have a way to get to school mm -hmm. because they don't have childcare or get to work for that matter. So the social compact that supposedly existed, right, for our students and the communities are falling apart and is absolutely manifesting yep. in a particular population. Um, the completion rate for classes are lower. We see gaps. Um, more students are taking a dropping out. More students are in that profile um, are taking longer and taking incompletes. Mm -hmm. So our immediate response was, okay, we need to keep our food banks open. And now we're delivering foods to our students. Uh, they would like order on an app, we package it up and there's a nonprofit that delivers it out every day. Mm -hmm. We're sending out laptops because there's no laptops and hotspots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for our students. And we are um, trying very hard to keep them fed, right? And their families um, in food supplies and basic needs and saying to them, we're gonna forgive your debts. So we wiped out um, probably hundreds of thousands of debt from spring to fall so that folks will re-enroll. We extended the, the withdrawal period so they have longer to decide. We made some courses pass fail. Mm -hmm. And we said to our institutions, care and caring and grace yes. is going to save a generation of students and scholars. And, you know, the reason why I agree to come here and talk with you, Dr. Coleman, is because the whole idea of caring and care and grace mm -hmm. and the understanding of resilience mm -hmm. and that our, our society did not build resilience into these communities. And you're seeing however resilient these students are, they're breaking down. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I, and, and I was in conversations today talking about principals and teachers, and we're just going to be beginning to see the, the energy collapse. I mean, it, it, this is going to be a, uh, the trauma, uh, the, the dislocation, the anxieties that people have been kind of fighting with and trying yep. to solve. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply afraid for, for what's going on. But you mentioned, so you were example of care seems to require the institution to respond to the individual's needs in their context versus a traditional institutional response with, you need to learn how to adapt to us. We're preparing you <laughs> for the next step. So the better you can adapt to us, the better prepared we're doing it. And is that, um, am I missing that reversal of, of Okay. No, you, you are you are so right on the nose, right, right here. Um, because in some ways, this takes me back to the context of post World War II. It takes me back to the context of the origins of the academy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So the origins of the academy. Um, well, we won't go all the way back to the 13th centuries and, the, and the <laughs> <laughs> not today. No, not, not in this That's half hour. But, you know, you know, we're it, not it, talking it, about monks in the monasteries. In session three, we'll get there. Right. But when you, but you, when you look at the traditional academy in, in the United States, right, Harvard was built for the second sons of landowners mm -hmm. who needs to go into the priesthood and therefore education. Mm -hmm. um, community colleges, women's colleges, historic black colleges are built because there was a need for women people of color, particularly Blacks, as well as um, immigrants and, 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 and first-generation college goers to have a place to go to college. Mm -hmm. So when I group those three schools together, it is the, uh, the, the resiliency of the American educational system mm -hmm. in designing for the individual, yeah. right? So the individual is no longer the second sons of the homeowner. Yeah. or the landowner because they have their own resiliency built into wealth. Whereas the other three categories, mm. 
um, not so much. So my caring for my students is not that unusual. We're simply restoring that privilege that students are not getting at home or from their lack of wealth building yeah. in the United States, right? And that's one level of caring. And for years, we kept saying, well, we're working on this developmental education stuff. We're doing all of this teaching and learning reform. Why isn't it working? It isn't yeah. working because we weren't paying attention to the right things. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's true in K-12, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's where K-12 is going right now, mm -hmm. right? The, the emotional care, the emotional yeah. uh, resilience. How, how, how do we get people who have been part of these institutions yes. uh, for a whole host of reasons? much of them out of their control and out of their design to engage in what are essentially in some ways uh, foreign or, or other cultural institutions and yes. how you focus on their engagement. That's and, that, exactly right. and you're suggesting that's, the, that's a fundamental act of care. It, it is fundamental to the whole idea of education mm -hmm. in the free mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, when, I, when I look at everything that is successful, you need to have a match between the systems that we built and the policies that we implement and the and the and the cultural wealth and the assets of the individual mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so if you look at the cultural wealth and the assets of our white population that's been building over at least the last 200 years if not four and if you if not more mm -hmm. it, it, so it is not so much that there's a difference in the way that populations respond but that one particular cultural group has gotten a head start. Okay, so, so I think in every successful educational venture, there is a match between um, the, the expectations and the cultural, the cultural and intellectual expectations of the educational system in the way that it's built, the, the way the system is built and mm -hmm. its policies and the cultural assets the cultural and intellectual assets of the students. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so that match works really well in selective, predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's beginning to work well in historic black institutions. Yep, yep. As well as women's colleges and women's institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The public K 12s and the public community colleges, we are beginning to do that matching. Yeah, yeah. Except what is missing right now is the ability to inject resources mm -hmm. into the system to do that support. So for years, the community colleges have been doing re-engineering of teaching and learning in pedagogy and in developmental education and remedial education to compress and accelerate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What we didn't pay attention to is that our system was not designed for Blacks, for Latinx, for, for eight South Asians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And if, if you're not assimilating, the system doesn't love you. Mm -hmm. And the system mm -hmm. says, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, meet our idea of, of meritocracy, mm -hmm. or else you're gonna drop out. Well, yeah. we need to do away with all of that. There's nothing wrong with our students. Yep. Our system is broken. So that matching of yeah, individual to... need, right? Com community need but is, you... um, it's mismatched. But you're making the argument, it seems to me, that the system has to change, yes. not the students, which is, I think, a shift. I hear that as a shift in historic, particularly higher ed value structures, where our job is to provide this opportunity that people have to prepare themselves to take advantage of. But yes. are you arguing particularly the community colleges, we can argue all colleges, but particularly the community colleges, are the ones who have to turn and say, who am I serving and how do I do it well? And right. that may need to change depending on who my audience is. Right, well, I, I think there, COVID is really in a way pushing us and not just COVID, mm -hmm. there's a twin pandemic going on, right? It's, it's COVID and it's anti-Black and anti-minority racism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So those two things really came together to really open our eyes. And I think the self-reflection that higher education needs to do, whether you're a community college or you're the selectives of the world, mm -hmm. is who are you building the educational system for? The selectives in, in across the United States is less than 5% of all the students. Yeah. 
are we are you telling me that the other 95% of the po student population is lacking in talent and will and and all of that stuff yeah. and only that 5% is valuable yeah and then right? actually with for example the average millionaire is a c student yeah because they pick an area that, that, that and then that is not necessarily what the average uh, average outcome from people who go to selective college so, but you're asking for these tough decisions. My question is, what's the role of character? How do you think about character in this in this uh, um, uh, decision making process? And, and how does that both both the character of others in your own development? How does that play into your leadership decision and and approach to this problem solving? I I think character is formed by the time you're ten years old. You know, the ability to tell right and wrong, the ability to be empathetic um, comes early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is the unlearning mm -hmm. that to me is key to character. So we have an opportunity now, post COVID in the middle of a, a, a second blossoming of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. to be able to ask the question of, are we serving everyone with our higher education system? So the unlearning, I think, is the unlearning of the idea of elitism, mm -hmm. the unlearning of arrogance, mm -hmm. the unlearning of racism and implicit bias yep. um, and, and colorism and judgment. Mm -hmm. I know that sometimes when I say those words, um, because they're buzzwords in the environment, it gives it a sheen of either leftist progressivism, or if I say it the other way, you know, ultra nationalist conservatism. Yeah. That's not what I mean. I mean the unlearning of both ends, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the elitism that is that is filtering through the work that we do as higher education um, servant leaders is on both sides. Yep. Yep. <laughs> of the political spectrum. So I think the key of character is really to go back to basics and ask about your reaction to the student in front of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the student is poor and does not have enough to eat and is failing in algebra because he or she or they are not getting hands-on enough time for tutoring or being able to go to class because they have all these barriers, then what does your character tell you? Yeah. If you were 10 years old, yeah. it is not to discard that person for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and peg them to you know, some low paying job that has no growth. It is naturally to, to lift, right? To, yeah. look at the, to look at the true individualism mm -hmm. that America's foundational values are, are, are pegged to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not individualism plus meritocracy, yeah. but individualism with sympathy. So for me, the, the question of character is very simple. Yeah. And the test is the student in front of you, and then it extends out to the system. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, I think the burden of character would be so heavy that none of us are going to be able to carry it. Mm -hmm. Pam, you, you're describing what I think is a dilemma and a challenge for all of us to kind of resolve. You're talking about a world that's oriented to supporting individuals flourishing. Yes. Coming from where they are to where they best should go. Yes. And how do we organize to that? But then you're also talking about a broad system change, particularly a system that historically has been picking winners. So part of our questions that we think about is, you have multiple constituents. That's right. That, you, that, that you're having to integrate and pull together a community you're trying to build. So in yeah. your, as you approach that challenge of bringing, as you're saying, the, the left groups who have a whole definition of what the individual should be and do, where they come from, and the right who's saying all the things about opportunity and, and why should we adapt, they should adapt, you know, but lots of these land, all these constituents that you're in the middle of, and then employers yes. who who need who who need you to help this group of students get to a certain place so they can they can their businesses can flourish. How do you 
what are your guide stars for integrating those conversations across your constituents? Okay, so so this is a parallel that may take a minute to explain. Mm -hmm. In the same way that the unit of change is the individual, and then it goes up to the classroom and it goes up to you know a school or a system, I think the unit of change or the unit of effectiveness for me is that we cannot be absolute and we must understand that this process of systems change and educational reinvention mm -hmm. um, is not a moment in time. It has never been a moment in time. And anybody who tells you that Einstein did it all at once or Steve Jobs did it all at once or Raytheon or whatever it is that yeah. you believe is your marker of success did it all at once mm -hmm. is telling a tale out of school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because all progress on all success is about process, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it is not the, <laughs> to quote, to, to, you know, to quote um, Miranda, it is, not a it is not a moment, it is a movement. Mm -hmm. And if you see yourself as the savior mm -hmm. of a system, if you hire a superintendent or a college president, or if you hire a chancellor because you believe this person is going to come in and in six months solve everything, yeah. you're out of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't understand human beings and systems mm -hmm. and human civilization. Well, what prevents that? I mean, I, I, so, because you, as you know, I'm I'm seeing this most uh, explicitly being played out within the conversations of leadership in the Boston public school system. Absolutely. Where we have we 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 turn back to the wonderful days of Pazant and Lang, but the, everyone points to the length of his service, the length of Carol's service. Yes. And this expectation we put on individuals to somehow be able to just by their presence change how how do we how do you because you're you're in that situation too you're in a high profile largest community college yes. you're in the middle of the boston economic world you're at tables with all the major power sources and players and the people of great need whom you serve how do you what guides you in your everyday decisions to push a narrative of collective systematic care. How do you help drive that narrative? You, for your own mental sanity, and for many years, you know, I bought into the I bought into the disruption and change and immediate result kind of kind of work. It took me a, a couple of years to get out of that. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe now that I work within a movement. There are 1,200 community colleges and college presidents working with me. Yep, yep. And that as long as I'm not so full of hubris, mm -hmm. that I believe that because I lead a community college, that I'm the only one who is the solution. And we know when yep. you have that kind of rhetoric, what happens, right? So, so I have 200, 300 full-time faculty and staff leading with me. Mm -hmm. And if I believe that I am shoulder to shoulder with them rather than standing aside and saying, I'm the college president, yeah. if the definition of a college president mm -hmm. is that you are with the crew and helping steer the ship rather than out there with the rope pulling the ship, which is yeah. not how it happens, it makes your work easier which also means that I can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I can help prioritize, which means the last thing that's on my priority list may not get taken care of, but I've got 300 other people who might be doing that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's, it's seeing, is it's discarding the idea of American individualism mm -hmm. as the rugged individualism of a, mm -hmm. of a Daniel Boone, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Or even, even of a Martin Luther King. Yeah. Right. Because Martin Luther King didn't do it by himself. It right. He created a movement so other people can carry on the work. We're 60 mm -hmm. years hence. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we're still doing that work. But people who say, well, nothing has changed are also lying. A lot has changed. Yeah. A lot has changed. And, you, and you, I, 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 I want to hold you on that. You said lying. So I want to, yes. I want to deconstruct that. Are they lying or are they pushing an inaccurate narrative? It is as bad as a narrative. Yep. 
as any of the false narratives that are out there that I'm not going to repeat because you know what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Folks who are absolutists, and we have a lot of that going on on both sides. Both sides, yep. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and it's folks who are willing to recast the narrative with nuance mm -hmm. who are truly the folks who move yep. movements. And, and I would caution people who are coming through um, our programs, our higher ed programs, both in the, in, the, you know, in the graduate schools, be careful how they cast um, their work in social justice and their work in, um, in racial justice and their world and their work in lifting our students. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're absolutist, it does the students no good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's scary. So, you know, so that's the parallel, yeah. Dr. Coleman, that I have. Yep. That you don't fix it in one day and you don't fix it by yourself. And, but the Ezra Klein podcast the other day uh, was giving, a, had a Southern historian talking about the Constitution. Yes. And in this, uh, Mayor Professor Holton ended it by talking about Jefferson and Washington, saying we have to separate the heroics from their being heroes. Yes. And that they did some heroic things. Yes. But neither of them freed their slaves. And then, <laughs> so the, the, and they, and people are complex. And if we focus, the argument would be, and, and I, I want to make sure this is what I'm hearing from you that as we think of individual heroes and powerful people, we're misconstruing how yes. the world works. It's really how the individuals with, who care, who are willing to take risks, who are listening to others, have the humility to understand this community, as they push their, those ideas forward, that could be a heroic a process, but it doesn't make them special. It just they're at the right time, right place. And that's how systems get better. It, I, I, I really believe because I'm basically someone who's brought up in the liberal arts tradition, mm -hmm. right? I, I was an English major and then I was a Japanese modern literature major and a Chinese philosophy um, um, student that, that words and language and documents and history and the things that are on the shelf half a life once they leave their author mm -hmm. because all literary works and all historical works are contextualized by the people who live them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so you know the folks who are sitting on the supreme court who believes that the constitution does not have any other meaning other than their basic meaning or folks who believe that the words of the bible should be taken completely literally or the people who believe um, that the words of any one of our great books, yeah. rather than holy or, or secular, is to be taken at the value of the point that they're written, mm -hmm. is missing the understanding of the human spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is the, the I believe that the, 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 the Declaration of Independence and our constitutions, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years from now, will still be applicable and important mm -hmm. because the people who lived them at that time gives it meaning. Gives it mean, yep. How, how do they, how they make land? And, and, and how do we create conditions in which they can take the risks yes. that making it live and present will demand? Right. And, and you know, that's why Ulysses is still about the search for home. Mm -hmm. It is still <laughs> about Mm -hmm. politics and and the and the ugliness of mm -hmm. of the way that they treat slaves and women yeah um and about temptation um it, it, <laughs> the fact that people believe that you know books will will absolutely be forever attached to their authors and the and the moral um absolutism of their authors will leave many many great things behind yeah um, and, and I think that really does have to do with the way that we look at higher education. Yeah. Higher education in this sector is a living being, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And if we don't continue to work it the way that we're working it, yeah. there would never have been black colleges, there would never have been women's colleges, nor community colleges, yeah. or yeah. some other new things that are coming through, the credentialing and the badging and the, this yeah. exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
And, and they are there for a reason because higher education and the people's need for higher education demands it. And that changes, you have to be responsive. Right, and the more we pay attention to our, who our students are, mm -hmm. I mean, both in an individual basis, but also what our data tells us mm -hmm. and what their cultural background tells us, mm -hmm. the more we are able to save the human spirit and the human potential. It's this is this is powerful. This is powerful for me every time I say it out loud, um, and it allows me to sleep at night. Yeah. Yep. To care, yep. to, to care for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not to make the this bit about character so complicated. Yeah. No, it, yeah. It, it is. So thank you so much. This this has been wonderful, and 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 as as many of the conversations, it it, it makes you really think and wonder and and. and and hope how do we how do we increase access to the this moment of, of care so i have one uh, one last question i'd love to, to leave to leave with it so if you could say something to your younger self and you can pick what younger self that is we're, we're both are point that you know what, what look young one time now look really young <laughs> okay um, this is a really <laughs> hard question for you to ask is it <laughs> it's and, okay i'm old yeah, yeah, so, so, so yeah, so yeah, so there, but there are lots of younger cells that we both have. Um, yes. What would you say to them now? And part of it because we, the part of the audience of, of this podcast are people who are going into leadership roles and who are thinking these things through about how they're going to make how how they're going to bring an ethic of care to their work, a focus on character, character, and 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 building community. So, what advice would you give to your younger self when you were starting out in this work? So I always think about the time when I was 35 um, and I'm working, you know, I was working really hard to get to the next level to, to mm -hmm. do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was anxious and I was looking at very short-term things. You're gonna look at your resume. How are you, you know, what is the next step? How are you interviewing? What books should I be reading? Oh my God, there's so many books on my shelf. How am I gonna get through them all? So now I say to folks who are 35 and I would say this to myself, the average age of an American female is 85 years old. Mm -hmm. You take 85 and you subtract 35. That's a good 50 years for you to work. Yeah. 50 years is a long time to do multiple reinvention of self mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the different work that you're going to do. And the thing that will serve you well is not that you stop being mindful about what you're doing, yep. but be open to possibilities that you can care for the world and the people you care about in, in a lot of different ways yeah. and not be so anxious, you yeah. know, give it time, make the commitment, but mm -hmm. give it time. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy the process. Yeah. You know, you thought, and you said this in different ways already, how, how, what do you have to let go so you can be in the old world, right? right? Uh, be here now. I can be with all your skills and all your energy and all your beliefs and all the things you want to know, no one wants to know. How can you bring that now in the presence of other people and use that relationship to drive our communities forward in a positive way? That takes a lot. It's not an easy, easy thing to say, very hard to do. Actually, it's, to me, it's relatively simple. Okay. The one thing that I give up is my title. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason why I always say to folks, call me Pam. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I, it is always awkward when I introduce myself as the president of a college. Yeah. Um, titles get, gets in the way of work. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that's the, the number one barrier that you get rid of when you become a, a servant leader. Mm -hmm. um, you can lead without the title. Yeah. Other people know what your titles are, you don't have to tell them. Yeah. You have to sit on the fear and sit on the, you know, the elitism that comes around. Um, to me, being president is simply, I've been here a while, I've got some strategies. Mm -hmm. Come on with me. Yeah. yeah. Let's take care of that student. So no, I, I don't find it complicated. Um, it, it, we're, we're in a world that, that sort of sits on that stuff. Yeah. And it's a burden. It's a burden that doesn't allow you to sleep at night. So yeah, let it go. You don't need it. <laughs> it really is true. Well, thank you so much for your time, Pam, and, and, and look forward to continuing working with you as we try to create a world in which uh, kids can thrive in this, in this region and in the nation. So, so Dr. Coleman, let me say one thing. 
Cardin, let me say one thing before yeah. I leave, which is you are one of the bright stars I follow um, in the greater Boston and in you know, the regional and, and the national world in that you work in rarefy air and you have, yet you have engaged in nurturing the individual student at their most vulnerable at the K-12 level. Um, I have watched you work over the last eight years since I've been back to Boston mm -hmm. and um, I learned from you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, th thank you. I should have stopped the recording five minutes ago because now I'm <laughs> blushing. Now you got me blushing. You know, you, I have you, it. Well, well, I'm recording hard. Okay, great, great. <laughs> but it's true. I, I think that's the way we survive, right? As colleagues and, and you as a, as a senior scholar in this area. Um, it's, it's how I look forward in that there is work to be done. Yep. Um, and it's important to me. Well, so thank you for that. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>